Welcome everyone. My name's Peter White. I'm the Head of First Nations Cultural Engagement here at the Museums of History, New South Wales. Um, I'm a Gumaroi Murray from northwest New South Wales, a little town called Manila. Um, and my role here is to help steer uh, this organisation into new ways of working with uh, our First Nations people, and particularly in the area of telling history. Um, some of that is what's been remembered and some of it hasn't. Uh, I'd like to start out with acknowledging country, the really important thing. I live on and work on Gadigal land as a Gumaroi person. I call myself a cultural diaspora down here. Um, I work hard to try and understand my cultural obligations uh, of working uh, and living and raising a family here on someone else's country. Uh, but more importantly, the work that we're actually trying to do here at Museums of History, New South Wales. Um, acknowledging this country and those people, the Gadigal people, uh, acknowledging what they've experienced since that first contact came and a house was built just outside. Um, understanding what and trying to think about what they have survived over that period of time and also what their aspirations and dreams are for their future. And I think that's always linked to the significance of this place, of the site of First Government House. And, you know, just a couple of days ago or weeks ago, we had a very, you know, important date in Australia's history, you know, April 25th, Anzac Day, which, you know, taught us or shows us and contributes a lot to this nation's identity. But I also reflect on that date of 25th of April in 1787, when the soon-to-be Governor Philip was given his instructions by Lord Sydney and the Privy Council. And I'll just read you out a quote that I, once more, I reflect on not only for Gadigal people, but all First Nations people, and why this place is so important. And the instructions, a part of the instructions were, you are to endeavour by every possible means to open an intercourse with the natives and to conciliate their affections, enjoying all our subjects to live in amity and kindness with them. And if any of our subjects shall wantonly destroy them, or give them any unnecessary interruption in the exercise of their several occupations, it is our will and pleasure that you do, that you do cause such offenders to be brought to punishment according to the degree of the offence. So to know where we are going, we need to understand where we have come from. And one of the programs that we're actually doing here, that we're here today, is the First Nations Speaker Series, which is about bringing and amplifying First Nations voices. We're very privileged to collaborate with GML Heritage and the Research Centre for Deep History at the Australian New, uh, National University to deliver this. And it's great to actually have Professor John Maynard here with us today to present to us Fight for Liberty and Freedom. So Professor Maynard you know, is a recognised thought leader in this space. Uh, as a First Nations, as a Warramai Aboriginal man from the Port Stephens region, you know, he's been at the forefront of these discussions, more importantly, not only about history, but that continuity of Aboriginal presence and the fight for recognition and the intersections of both Australian political history and social history and what it means. It's also great to welcome John here as a new member of our Museums of History New South Wales family, as our current board member of our new entity, Museums of History, 
Uh, and I'm, yeah, we're all really excited to be able to work with John and the wealth of experience that he brings across the many uh, platforms that he's worked on, uh, you know, the experience across numerous fellowships, awards, positions of guiding people in this really important area. So I'd just like to once more acknowledge Gadigal people, acknowledge their ancestors that are here with us today and helping shape the way we are in the future. And I'll invite John up. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Peter, for that um, kind introduction. As a Waramai man, uh, I also begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people, um, the traditional owners of the land upon which we gather here tonight, and also pay my respects to elders both past and present. And I also want to acknowledge uh, the Museums of History, New South Wales, for the kind invitation through the First Nation Speakers Series to be able to present here tonight. And thanks, everybody, for coming along. It is very appropriate that I speak here tonight on the topic of Fight for Liberty and Freedom, as my book on that <coughs> title was first published in 2007, appropriately right here um, in the Sydney Museum. Downstairs it was launched in the, in the um, then bookshop by Gary Foley and um, Jeff McMullen. And there they are up there at the time. Um, and that was very significant for me, you know. It, was, it, it had really taken on board about 20 years of work, that particular book, uh, to get to that point. The talk examines the rise of the first united all Aboriginal political organisation, the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association, the AAPA, and formed in uh, Sydney, right here in Sydney, in 1924. The formation of the AAPA provides an opportunity to understand the motivations, influence, inspiration and political platform of this early Aboriginal political movement, including the international influences and that kindled solid solidarity with global anti-colonial political movements of the day. The legacy and memory of these brave early Aboriginal activists from nearly 100 years ago uh, remains to encourage and inspire our people and all those that support us that the fight for Aboriginal rights and justice in this country goes on. And we can draw strength from our past. It is important to recognise that the AAPA are today recognised as the first united all Aboriginal political organisation to form in this country and they were led by this man, my grandfather, <laughs> Fred Maynard pictured here with his sister Emma at the rocks in 1927 and that is the emblem of the AAPA of the organisation that he led. Next year will mark 100 years since the AAPA formed here in Sydney to fight for Aboriginal rights and justice. And the history of the AAPA was a truth denied to this country for several decades. It still amazes me that the history and memory of these er early Aboriginal rights campaigners was allowed to disappear from the historical record and to a great extent memory as well. The AAPA would hold four annual conferences and fight a bitter five-year campaign against the New South Wales Aborigines Protection Board before being hounded out of existence by the police acting for the New South Wales Aborigines Protection Board. There would be a number of international connections and influences in my grandfather's political thinking. He had travelled widely as a young man, working as a stockman, timber getter, prospector, photographer, and witnessed the shocking conditions and hardship that Aboriginal people suffered under during that time. In the first decade of the 20th century, he was working here in Sydney on the docks as a wharf labourer. It was a frightening place of work. The men were exploited and forced to fight for their positions on the docks. It was here that my grandfather's political edge and voice was forged and connections to international black influence and inspiration. He, him and his brother Arthur actually lived down at Woolamaloo in Broham Street, you know, where they had easy access to the wharf and it 
wasn't such a flash area around here then in the docks area of Sydney, I have to say. And the, the working on the docks was known as the Hungry Mile. The first major um, connection for my grandfather was an organisation called the Coloured Progressive Association that formed in Sydney in 1903, was still operational in 1920. And it probably would have disappeared from view except for the visit to Australia in 1907 of Jack Johnson, the first black heavyweight boxing champion of the world. Um, he didn't get that title until 1908, but he came to Australia in 1907, had three fights where he knocked out all of his opponents. And this organisation called the Coloured Progressive Association held a farewell for Johnson in Sydney. And the photograph up the top there is a family photograph from my family. And my grandfather is pictured here, sitting there. There were a number of Aboriginal dock workers that were at that event. And I was actually discussing this photograph with an old uncle in western New South Wales back in the 90s. And the reality is it was always thought that this was the AAPA in the 1920s. And the old fellow said, that's not no AAPA. He said, that's much earlier. And he said, that man at the back, he said, that's Mr Jack Johnson. <laughs> you know, and I was a bit of a boxing aficionado and I looked at the image and I thought I even got a magnifying glass and I thought, that does look like Jack Johnson. And I finished up, I come back to Sydney and spent weeks in the State Library going through all the old newspapers and finished up, uncovered a newspaper coverage of the farewell to Jack Johnson that was this actual event. And as we know, Johnson returned to Australia in 1908. He'd always been denied the opportunity of fighting for the world heavyweight title. They drew a colour bar. Um, Jim Jeffries retired as champion, but he wouldn't fight Jack Johnson. You know, he said, I'm not fighting no black. You know, we don't, we don't allow blacks into the ring to fight for world titles. You know, they've got a yellow streak, you know, and... Uh, the reality was they were all frightened to death of actually getting into the ring with Jack Johnson. Tommy Burns was then installed as the new heavyweight champion. He went round the world defending his title and Jack Johnson was on a boat following him and wherever Burns was, Johnson was there baiting him in the uh, media uh, scrums that were held to welcome Burns or discuss his fights and there's Jack Johnson. Muhammad Ali much later said, that Jack Johnson was the start of everything I did. His outspokenness and the way he promoted himself, the way he confronted the wide establishment, uh, many of the things that Ali took on board later on, he said, were influenced by Johnson. Anyway, Burns came to Australia in 1908 for a number of um, exhibition fights. Again, Jack Johnson followed him out here. There was a media conference in, arranged and there was a promoter in the audience, uh, U.D. McIntosh. He was an entrepreneur of Sydney. He'd won and lost a number of fortunes uh, along through the years and had sold meat pies and done an awful lot, lot of things. He was in the audience this particular day and, you know, the questions were raised about why don't you fight Jack Johnson? And um, he said, oh, you know, same sort of thing. And then McIntosh jumped up and he had the name, the nickname, huge deal, Macintosh. And he said, what would it take for you to fight Jack Johnson? And just taken aback, he just said 6,750 pounds, which was a sum thought to be out of the realms of all probability of anyone putting up to put on this fight. And with that, Macintosh banged his hand down onto the chair, vacant chair next to him and said, done. <laughs> in front of this media audience. And that was tens and tens and tens of millions equivalent today. McIntosh built the Sydney Stadium at Rushcutters Bay just for that world title fight. 20,000 people were inside, 40,000 were outside, and it remained the biggest sporting event with an international focus um, globally until the 1956 Olympic Games. It was the first time, we have to remember, a black man was going to get into the ring with a white fighter and fight for a world title. Now, the fight was a mismatch. Johnson absolutely destroyed Tommy Burns in that fight, but he was like a cat 
playing with the mouse. He did not want to end that fight. I mean, he took him apart piece by piece, taunted him in the ring and taunted the largely racist crowd which were hurling abuse at Johnson throughout the fight. And Johnson was just smiling at him and just playing with Burns and talking to Tommy Burns throughout the fight. He said, Mrs Burns is not going to recognise you when you get home tonight, Tommy. <laughs> and he actually put his hands down at one point and said, go ahead, Tommy. Give me your best punch. What can you do, Tommy? And he allowed Burns to just punch into him and just laughed at him and just brushed him aside. By the 14th round, he was just an absolute beaten wreck. The police jumped into the ring, stopped the fight, and Jack Johnson was hailed as the world champion. The inspiration of Johnson to people like my grandfather and Aboriginal communities and black people and oppressed people around the world was astronomical. It was just the charisma and the way that he presented himself to the white world and very much in a confrontational way which really um, put them back in their, in their place, so to speak. There was a great quote I like, and this was recorded about Jack Johnson driving through the south in a big hotted up car and um, being pulled over by the police in Mississippi for speeding. And uh, he was fine, say, you know, $50 or $100, whatever it was at that point, was quite a lot of money. And Johnson handed over double the amount. And the police officer said, are you trying to be funny, boy? And Jack Johnson's reply was, I'm coming back this way. <laughs> and that is recorded as a factual story of, of, of Jack Johnson. But again... Um, the impact of him and his outspokenness, his real political edge um, was confronting to the white establishment. So this was certainly an inspiration for the Aboriginal movement that come out of that in the, in the decade ahead. The next big uh, inspiration was Marcus Garvey, who established the biggest black movement ever seen in the United States. Um, globally, over two million members Famous people like Malcolm X's father was a member of Garvey's organisation. Mandela said it all began with Marcus Garvey. Martin Luther King said the big influence was Marcus Garvey. Even Ho Chi Minh, the Vietnamese leader in Vietnam, he was a merchant sailor in the 1920s who attended Garvey's massive meetings in Harlem in the 1920s. So such was the outreach of of Garvey. Garvey's message was self-determination, social and economic reform, economic independence, pride in culture and black history, and also belonging to country. In an African-American sense, that was back to Africa. But Aboriginal people took that on as being what's under your feet. You, we still belong to our country. We hadn't been removed from it in the sense of African-Americans and being deported somewhere else. So it was that sense. A chapter of Garvey's operational uh, organisation was set up here in Sydney between 1920 and 1924 and my grandfather and Tom Lacey and other early Aboriginal political activists were members of Garvey's organisation. But a lot of the political um, ideals that really come from the 1920s Aboriginal political movement come from Garvey's material particularly his newspaper, which had a massive circulation worldwide. Garvey used merchant sailors to spread his message and it was manifestos and news, black newspapers that were landing in the laps of Aboriginal dock workers like my grandfather in the 1920s. And you've got to remember the white Australia policy had been set up in 1904 and black sailors coming into this country, there was no red carpet rolled out for them and when they saw black dock workers down there, that's who they gravitated to uh, meet with and talk with and discuss and spend time with. And the reality is that people like my grandfather was through that moment realised that racism, prejudice and oppression that we were facing here wasn't just a localised thing, it was a global thing. And the reality is that's where we needed to take on... Um, as I said, the manifestos and political ideals of what was happening overseas. There's an important area, and I was actually discussing this with Peter earlier today, of history that many people don't know. 
And I'm talking about New South Wales here, but this also happened in Queensland, Victoria and South Australia. A period of time between 1850 and 1910, Aboriginal people began to regain land. You know, after the shock of invasion, occupation, dispossession, cultural destruction, we had begun to regather and still connected to country, write letters and petitions to the state government. Some were written by educated Aboriginal people and some were written by white supporters to the government, asking for 20, 30, 40, 50 acres of land for Aboriginal people to you know, look after their families on and starting up fam farming enterprises. I've seen these records in the state archives and the reality is, in those days, there was no mission manager out there. The local police officer was contacted to go out and have a look at the, the land these Aboriginal people are asking for. The letters from the police officer is there in the records going back to the state government. It's heavily timbered, worthless scrub. Give it to them. So the, hand, the land was handed over to Aboriginal people. There's a lot of these records there in reality. So Aboriginal people, they've got their land. 18 months later, same police officer sends a report back to the state government. The land's been cleared. It's been fenced. They've, cro they've got crops. They've built a homestead. They've got livestock. Again, the ar ar archival records speak of Aboriginal people clearing 100, 200, 300, 500 pounds of maize and other... Um, materials that were produced on their land. Very profitable time period. One Aboriginal family had got their own piano. Gary Foley's great-grandfather, Jim Doyle, is recorded as owning five properties, five houses, a boat-building enterprise, and had invested a thousand, um, in a 1,000 war bonds. I mean, his wealth was quite significant at that particular point, but no wonder Gary Foley finished up, fired up in the decades ahead because that was all ripped away from his great-grandfather, Jimmy Doyle. So this really successful time period, if we had been allowed to continue along this path, you know, of self-subsistence um, and economic independence, we wouldn't be in the position still today where we are. Now, you can look at this graph and this is the land in the yellow that Aboriginal people had regained. And you can see from 1910 the incredible escalation of the New South Wales Aborigines Protection Board tearing those independent farms back off Aboriginal people. And the records are there again. The police go in. Aboriginal people are thrown off after four and five decades of prospering on this land at the point of a gun with nothing more on their backs than the shirts that they were wearing, thrown out into poverty to start again. Now, Heather Goodall called this back in the 1980s the second dispossession. And I mean, can you imagine the shock, the trauma and the horror of that experience? You'd recovered. We had regained a position of sense and self-worth. There was also a combination. Yes, we were using Western farming methods, but also Aboriginal subsistence. People were still speaking in language. They were still practising culture. They were combining the best of Western and Aboriginal means of being on the land. No one knew the seasons better than Aboriginal people. And on their own country, they prospered. And that's the tragedy of this particular period. The first Aboriginal convention ever held in this country was held at St David's Church and Hall, and here it is in Riley Street, Surrey Hills. It's not a very good picture, but that's the building as it was in 1926. The AAPA were front-page news in the Sydney press in 1925. Over 200 Aboriginal people attended this particular conference. I mean, you've got Sid Ridgway down the bottom, who was the secretary. Dick Johnson, a, a war um, hero, um, was the uh, treasurer. Uh, Tom Lacey and Mr A. Johnson and Cora um, Ridgway, um, Sid's wife, who was actually my grandfather's cousin, 
um, who married Sid Ridgway. But over 200 Aboriginal people were in attendance at that conference and um, a remarkable event, a remarkable event. My grandfather delivered a, um, an address which was marked in the press um, for this particular event. And he said, brothers and sisters, we have much business to transact, so let's get right down to it. We aim at the spiritual, the political, the industrial and the social. This is Garveyism. This is actually taking out of Garvey's manifestos. We want to work out our own destiny. Our people have not had the courage to stand together in the past, but now we are united and are determined to work for the preservation for all of those interests which are near and dear to us. And as I said, this is 1925. Later in 1925, they held a second conference at Kempsey. And this is a remarkable event that historically has been overlooked. The Maclay Argus, the Maclay Chronicle, record this conference, ran over three days. All the papers were written and delivered by Aboriginal people. Incredibly, over 700 Aboriginal people attended that three-day event in Kempsey at, that sh at the showground and also at the Odd Fellows Hall. I went inside that sort of heritage building, that, that building where that conference was held, and I can tell you it made all the hairs in the back of my neck stand on end, knowing that these early Aboriginal activists nearly 100 years ago had held this conference there over three days. And as I said, the papers were all written and delivered by Aboriginal people. Some of those papers were delivered in language. And this is a time where anthropologists are already starting to make an impact and say there's no culture left in New South Wales. And yet here we have Aboriginal people delivering their papers in lingo. So clearly people can understand what they're talking about. Um, it was absolutely a remarkable event. What were the, what were the, um, the topics? Um, land rights, of course, demanding enough land for each and every Aboriginal family. Protecting their families. They wanted the practice of the Protection Board removing Aboriginal children stopped. They wanted citizenship. They wanted to be placed in charge of Aboriginal affairs. These were the demands. Health, housing, all of these things were discussed. Many of the things that we're still fighting for today. My grandfather, at the conclusion of that conference, um, delivered a powerful resolution that was sent to the New South Wales State Government, the Commonwealth Government, and was published widely across New South Wales in newspapers. I have to look back at, you know, 20 years ago or 20-year period of searching through records, I'd uncovered about four or five references to this manifesto in newspapers. With the aid of Trove, the <laughs> National Library's magnificent search engine, it was published practically in every town in New South Wales, as well as Queensland, Victoria and South Australia. That's how widely the message went. And then my grandfather's, um, he delivered this, um, this powerful um, resolution. And he said, as it is the proud boast of Australia that every person born beneath the Southern Cross is born free, irrespective of origin, race, colour, creed, religion or any other impediment, we, the representatives of the original people, in conference assembled, demand that we shall be accorded the same full rights and privileges of citizenship as are enjoyed by all other sections of the community. And as I said, this went to the state government, the Commonwealth government, and was published widely. In 1927, the AAPA produced a manifesto. And again, this was published, as I said, widely across the state. And the platform for the AAPA, if you like, was the first instance of a national land rights agenda. They demanded enough land for each and every Aboriginal family in the country. They also wanted the Protection Board's practice of removing Aboriginal kids stopped. And they wanted Aboriginal people to be placed in charge of Aboriginal affairs. 
And you can see that one at the bottom. Um, that the control of Aboriginal affairs, apart from common law rights, shall be vested in a board of management comprised of capable, educated Aboriginals under a chairman to be appointed by the governor. But this was Commonwealth government they were talking about. They wanted the state control over Aboriginal affairs abolished and that it was the federal government that needed to be placed in charge of Aboriginal affairs. The manifesto was dismissed by the New South Wales Aborigines Protection Board and my grandfather was informed of notification of that from the Jack Lang government in New South Wales that the Protection Board was well capable of caring for Aboriginal people and were doing a good job as far as that was concerned in a difficult area and that these activists or people making this noise were a rabble you know, we're doing more to disturb Aboriginal people than to do anything to assist them. When my grandfather became aware of that response from his dismissal from the state government, he wrote a stinging response to the... Um, I've lost it again. ..to the government. It's a three-page letter and um, it's one of the most powerful ever written by an Aboriginal activist. And I certainly can't read the three pages here, but this one powerful section clearly um, displays his distaste to the state government. He said, I wish to make it perfectly clear on behalf of our people that we accept no condition of inferiority as compared with the European people. Two distinct civilizations are represented by the respective races. That the European people, by the art of war, destroyed our more ancient civilization is freely admitted and that by their vices and diseases our people have been decimated is also patent. But neither of these facts are evidence of superiority. Quite the contrary is the case. The members of the AAPA have also noted the strenuous efforts of the trade union leaders to attain the conditions which existed in our country at the time of invasion by Europeans. The men only work when necessary. We called no man master and we had no king. A very powerful um, a response. The AAPA continued with a widespread media campaign to embarrass all sections of government, particularly the Protection Board, over the shocking conditions of Aboriginal people. Uh, they established offices in Crown Street, uh, Sydney, and, and set up a widespread network of information between Aboriginal communities getting news to uh, the Aboriginal activist and the AAPA. And I recorded people, um, old Uncle Reuben Kelly, long deceased now, but was a, a kid at Bellbrook during the 1920s who recalled to me that somehow the community knew when Fred Maynard was in the area and they would give letters and notes to us kids to go off and follow the creek down and there would be your grandfather sitting under a bridge which we handed materials and notes and letters of things that were happening on the Mish which he would then bring up in the press to embarrass the board. And they received these letters from right, ac right across the state and it was part of this that my grandfather received news of the plight of a young Aboriginal girl who'd been taken from a family, placed on a... Um, uh, a station um, with a um, manager. Um, she was 14 years of age and had been raped repeatedly on that station. She became pregnant to this guy. And, I mean, st she's still under protection board control. They get news of this. What do they do? They put her on a train down here to Sydney where she has that baby. The records say the baby died. We're not to know that the baby may well have been removed. We're not to know that. What did they do to that girl? They put her back on the train and sent her straight back to the place of abuse. The most shocking treatment. My grandfather, when he heard this, he wrote, a, um, uh, a, again, another three-page letter to, to this young girl. Um, and what he wanted to do was, um, you know, give me the details of the perpetrator and I'll see this man in, in court. Sadly, the girl never received the information. The guy actually opened the letter and he sent it back to the protection board. I mean, 
And instead of acting against this guy, who is a criminal in what he's doing to a young girl, is they hammered the Aboriginal activist. You know, this was their response to this. And here's the letter, a small section of the letter my grandfather wrote, which sits in the archives. And he wrote to that girl, my darling little sister, I'm speaking to you now as a big bro. My heart is filled with regret and disgust as you were taken down by those who were supposed to be your guide through life. I may tell you, and listen, girly, your case is one in dozens with our girls. More is the pity. God forbid those white robbers of our women's virtues seem to do just as they like with downright impunity. And mind you, my dear girl, the law stands for it. And as I said, the police... Uh, the, the protection board reacted with police intimidation and threat of my grandfather and the other Aboriginal activists of that um, time period. And that is covered in a 1927 um, interview my grandfather did um, in a newspaper. Oops. And he said, you know, in regards to the police... Um, He appealed for assistance in fighting the absolutely degrading system government administration at present in vogue. He said that he'd been warned on many occasions that the doors of Long Bay Jail were opening for him. He would cheerfully go to jail for the remainder of his life, he declared, if by so doing he could make the people of Australia realise the truly frightful administration of the Aborigines Act. He knew cases where children had been torn from their mothers and sent into absolute slavery. The AAPA were eventually handed out of public existence in 1929 by the police. And you've got to remember that the New South Wales Aborigines Protection Board, the chairperson of the Protection Board was also the police commissioner for New South Wales. So the power of the police over Aboriginal people was extreme. In that particular time period, it's a police state for Aboriginal people. Now, the legacy and historical truth of the AAPA and its political platform all those years ago continues to resonate today. When one reads the Uluru Statement of the Heart, it is important that we recognise that this is not a new directive. In fact, it reflects nearly a century of similar demands made by Aboriginal people for their rights and recognition. The Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association raised several key elements embedded that are embedded in the 2017 Uluru Statement of the Heart. In his inaugural address as President of the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association in Sydney in 1925, we want to be in charge of our own destiny. Those very words appear in the Uluru Statement. Back at the first ever Aboriginal Conve uh, Rights Convention at St David's Church and Hall again in Sydney, where I said over 200 people were in attendance and also front page news in the press, Aborigines demand self-determination was one of the banners and self-determination is their aim. This was 50 years before the Whitlam government accredited with putting up self-determination as the desired Aboriginal policy approach. And finally, back in 1927, the AAPA manifesto demanded that clearly the control of Aboriginal affairs, apart from common law rights, shall be vested in a board of management comprised of capable, educated Aboriginals. So the truth is the call for a voice to Parliament has in fact been a very long one. In 1927, Prime Minister Stanley Bruce contacted Jack Lang to inform him that a request had been made for an extra-parliamentary royal commission into the present status and general conditions of the Aborigines. Lang referred the matter to the uh, Protection Board to respond. Their negative misinformed response sadly sits as a, as a reminder of this organisation's sinister impact upon Aboriginal lives for the greater part of the 20th century. And the Board said, Board doubts that the appointment for a commission to inquire into the matter is called for so far as New South Wales is concerned. 
In early 1928, a commission on the Constitution finally came together in Canberra to discuss, amongst other issues, relations to Aboriginal policy. My grandfather and missionary supporter activist Elizabeth Mackenzie Hatton wrote a joint response to the Commonwealth Government beseeching their intervention and asserting that the Commonwealth Government was better equipped, more capable and accounting, accountable of managing Aboriginal affairs than were the states. They directed that the present system of constituted laws and administration under the six states is now obsolete. The Secretary of the AAPA, Ben Rowntree, also sent a letter to the Constitution, strongly stating that the Aboriginal demands for the Commonwealth Government action, stating our unswerving loyalty is with you to solidify the whole of the Aboriginal position throughout Australia for the abolition of state control as constituted, which we claim is against our best interests. Sadly, the Commission did nothing to ameliorate the Aboriginal position and the hopes of the AAPA and its supporters were dashed. The AAPA, as I said, disappeared from public view in 1929. Joe Anderson, a member of the AAPA during the 1920s, famously delivered an address on Sinisand in 1933 as King Burriga, where he declared powerfully, all the black man wants is representation in federal parliament. Now, I've been researching my grandfather and the organisation he formed um, for more than 30 years, and it simply amazes me that more and more material comes to light. Only in recent times, an article found through the National Library of Australia's Trove um, big, brings new light to bear on the AAPA. The article published in the Sydney Labor Daily in 1929 stated that two Aboriginal speakers would put their case forward for Aboriginal policy reform. It revealed that on the following Tuesday evening at the School of Arts in Chatswood, the president of the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association, Mr F.G Maynard, accompanied by another speaker, would address the members of the Chatswood Willoughby Labor League on Aboriginal matters generally. My grandfather was described as a forceful and logical speaker who would explain some of the disadvantages under which his people labour. It was said that he was striving by voice and pen in bringing about much needed reform. It was for, further revealed that there was a move to establish an association of white Australians to assist with a push to have an Aboriginal represent his people in federal parliament, or failing that, have an Aboriginal ambassador appointed to live in Canberra to watch his people's interests and advise the federal authorities. This is a remarkable find and reveals the strong sentiment nearly 100 years ago pushing for an Aboriginal voice in federal parliament. I never met my grandfather. He sadly died eight years before I was born. Um, and it was a very hard life for my family. Um, he had an accident, a so-called accident on the wharf in Sydney, uh, where he was in and out of hospital for 12 months. One leg was broken in six places. A sugar diabetes sent in, gangrene, his legs were removed, and he was completely incapacitated. Um, my grandmother was a white woman, and this also caused some issues at that particular time in Sydney because it was not the done thing for an Aboriginal man, particularly a very outspoken one, to marry a white woman. And my grandmother wasn't from a well-to-do or even a middle-class family. She was from a poor white mining family and was a single mother when she met my grandfather. They went on to have four kids and, as I said, with his accident, my grandmother had to rear the five kids and they survived on two pounds a fortnight from St Vincent's to Paul. In the contemporary setting, we need to mobilise support like never before in embracing the voice to um, Parliament and its ideals of finally seeking to heal from the past and provide a platform that is just and equitable for all Australians. The legacy and memory of the AAPA and its membership of, and supporters nearly 100 years ago provides a clear message from the past that this recognition and truth is long, long overdue. Thank you. 
I have to say, the, the book, when it was launched in two, 2007, has never been out of print, but I've been asked to revise, expand and update, so since that time I've found a lot of new material and I'm working on that and I actually want it to be out before the end of the year. And interestingly enough, the book was translated and published in China in 2016, so which is, I mean, I take great pride in that. But anyway, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, John. Now, I think we have about 10 minutes for questions. Yeah. So, uh, my colleague here, Samantha Snedden, who's our First Nations producer, yeah. um, also has a mic. So, please feel free to ask away. Hey. Um, I was just wondering what what did what what sort of life did your granddad have? Like, do you know much about him growing up, and did you get to go to school? And you know, oh, yeah, like yeah, no, it's like it's, a, it's yeah. an interesting, it's a really interesting life. I mean, um, my family moved from Port Stephens to Dungog. They were living up on the mountains there. Um, his grandmother was uh, in the records a full Aboriginal woman who could read and write. I mean, the only way she could have learnt to read and write was at the AA Company School um, at Port Stephens during that period. And certainly um, Aboriginal people weren't precluded or left out of that particular school. Uh, Dawson was very supportive of the Aboriginal people in the area. Parry, not so much later, or um, Gregson, who came as um, directors of the AAPA. So she had an educational background. She married a guy from uh, the Isle of France, Jean-Philippe, who anglicised his name to John Phillips. He couldn't read or write at all. But he was regarded from family uh, recollection. He was a black man from the Isle of France, present-day Mauritius. Um, their daughter, Mary, finished up working at a property near Hinton in Maitland as a domestic, and she became pregnant to old Mr Pearce. And again, the stories that we hold is that he had an attraction to this child that was born because it was his own offspring and he paid a labourer, William Maynard, on the property to marry Mary and even provided a small house on the property for them. And Mary and William Maynard had another six kids, which included also my grandfather. Mary then died in, in childbirth with two twins and as soon as that happened, the labourer guy took off. The only child who was retained by the Pierce family was the firstborn son, William, because he was the offspring of Earl Pierce. My grandfather and his brother, Arthur, finished up with a minister at Dungog. And again, the oral memories of you know, my uncles and aunties and also my father that were passed down, hearing and recalling their grandfather say that this minister, where he and his brother Arthur, they were only five and six-year-old kids, worked, was the cruelest man that ever walked the planet. But one thing he had was a large library and rammed that down and gave freedom to these kids. And recollections, again, by the age of nine or ten, my grandfather was reading um, biology and philosophy and history and taking all of this stuff on. So there was a self-education and also a forced education, if you like, from this guy. Very, very cruel man. By the age of 12 or 13, my grandfather and Arthur ran away from that property. And, I mean, as I said, this is Dungog, but they finished up in Sydney with their older sister, Emma, who was working in a laundry. So that was a remarkable journey itself. We only have the the bits and pieces to connect that particular journey. But that's where his education came from. And I, back in that um, presentation, the family retains a massive dictionary that was my grandfather's and he poured over this dictionary learning words and language and, I mean, he really um, assumed and consumed as much knowledge as he could in words um, from the dictionary, which is interesting in the sense of Marcus Garvey, who did the same thing. He carried a dictionary with him everywhere. So that's the 
the educational, um, and then of course the trade union movement on the docks as well, and coming into contact with international black visitors and all of that fermenting his, you know, political outlook, if you like. Um, when you were mentioning from the decades from about 1850 to mm. 1910, mm. I think when, when um, uh, various people were able to get that land and you, mm. you mentioned that some white people were help, like writing Wrote letters in letters, support. Yep. Is, there, is there anything you could, like what kinds of people were writing those letters of support? Um, local people, I mean, I have to say... There were, not, there were not a lot of people supporting Aboriginal people. The movement itself had two champion peoples whose stories also need to be told. Very courageous. Elizabeth Mackenzie Hatton, the missionary woman, and JJ Maloney, a newspaper editor at Newcastle, he gave incredible editorial space to my grandfather and the other Aboriginal activists. Those two individuals copped a lot of police attention um, to shut them up and shut them down. So this really does need to be recognised as part of that. But again, the letters being written, there were people that really did um, like and supported Aboriginal people and were only too happy to assist them. There's one guy, Johnny Ridgway was one of the properties that was under threat at um, Foster. Uh, I mean, this was early 20th century um, and the Protection Board... But a, a guy at Foster said, these blacks have got to be put off. That's prime land. We want that land and they should be moved off. A local police officer wrote, and that record, that letter is in the records, supporting the Aboriginal people. He said, these are good people. They've worked this land for decades and all the improvements done on the land are because of their back-breaking work and don't take it away from them. Sadly, it was ripped away. You know, so there was much of that land. 27,000 acres was torn away during that period between 1910 and 1927. A lot of that on prime coastal land. You know, prime coastal land. We're worth a fortune today. Thanks very much for that talk. I think that was powerful and I forget the other word, but <laughs> you're your grandfather's grandson. I really love... A uh, question really is, do you think your book, the updated book, will be out this year? Because it's so good to hear this talk this year. Yeah, you know, yeah. Well, this is, this is the point when I contacted... It's, it's a, it was Aboriginal Studies Press in Canberra uh, with AATSIS that originally published the book. And I thought with the voice and the material that I've uncovered since connected to the voice and the development of that, that I contacted them and said, look... I think this would be timely if this comes out now in, in, in line with that. It won't be out in time before the voice is voted upon, sadly. But it's also timely. It's 100 years next year, 2024, since this organisation formed. They need to be recognised. This is overlooked so much as far as Aboriginal history is concerned. I still read a lot of these books where there's no mention of it, you know, Originally, it was thought that, um, you know, Aboriginal politics began in the 60s with Charlie Perkins and the Freedom Ride, the Gurindji walk off at Wave Hill, the 67 referendum, the Aboriginal 10 embassy. Extremely important, critically important moments in Aboriginal history. The same with 38, the day of mourning. Again, another critically important point. But then there is just a drop-off. And despite the fact of me publishing probably hundreds of articles and a book and many chapters on this organisation and speaking at so many locations, it still disappears from the record as far as other people are concerned. It needs to gain its spot, and particularly in light of, as I said, with the voice and the 100 years recognition. Um, thank you. This is um, yeah, truly in yeah, educational. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'm curious about the um, 700 people that came to, I think it was Kempsey. Kempsey. And that it got such wide publicity interstate. Mm. Do you think that's because speakers came from around the country? Is there a list of who spoke or, or mm. any, any no, information of, yeah. of the speakers? 
there's 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 nothing to draw attention to anybody coming from interstate. There were clearly they established thirteen branches with four sub branches, mostly South Coast, Sydney, Mid North Coast, and the Far North Coast, but also pockets in Western New South Wales as well. Um, there is nothing in the historical record to say of anyone coming from somewhere else, but there is not to say that they weren't. You know, there's a, a good friend of mine, Ray Kelly, is also up at Newcastle, who's done a lot of stuff on language. And Ray listened to a lot of the tapes that were recorded with old people, certainly because Ray's from Kempsey and Armidale, and has spent decades listening to those tapes. And one of those tapes is an old fella talking about Kempsey in about the 1920s. And Ray listened to that tape over and over again. And the old fella said, I rode my horse into Kempsey, and this was in Lingo, and there was a big manguin, which is a big event. And he said, I've never seen so many of my own kind. This was in the talk. And, you know, and I said to Ray, this is 25. This is what he's talking about. You know, and he went on to say with a bit of a laugh, and there was a beautiful girl <laughs> with a real sort of a laugh, you know, and uh, so, but yeah, that, that event was, you know, recorded, you know, as far as that old guy's memory was concerned, you know, who was recorded in the 70s looking back. Yeah. Time for one more question. <laughs> Thanks so much for that um, amazing talk. Um, I'm just wondering about um, the Coloured Progressives Association. Um, are there any, because I know that there were like, um, you know, uh, black convicts mm. coming on some of the first fleets mm. um, and like sort of marriages between First Nations people and um, black folks from black convicts. Mm. Um, do you know if they all, have you come across any sort of genealogies of the Coloured Progressives Association? No, I can't, can't say I have. I know some of the names, I mean, one of them, the president was a Mr W Grant who was African-American former steam tug captain. Most of them were merchant sailors, transitional, coming and going from Australia. But as I said, we know there were Aboriginal people connected with it. There were some people that were here, Indian from the subcontinent and some African-Americans who were at that time living here who were trying to say, look, this policy, you know, it needs to be removed, this white Australia policy. The Coloured Progressive Association even wrote a letter to the British Parliament, uh, Chamberlain, saying, you've got to do something, what they've brought in in Australia, this policy, this act. British government's got to come down heavily onto this. We're British subjects. <laughs> and, uh, and, of course, his reply was, oh, that's the Australian government to deal with and flicked it back. But no, no genealogies, sadly. But they were operational till 1920, you know, but... They had it when that that when that farewell was. I mean, the press that they had a hundred members, but in 1920 when they dissolved, there was only three members left. You know, but by that time, Garveyism had risen up, and there was a chapter of Garvey's movement in Sydney which attracted Aboriginal and Black people too, because this was all about you know Black nationalism and pride in who you were and fighting for your rights in a much more stronger our way. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you once more, John. It's, it is amazing, as you, as you said, the history that, particularly in New South Wales mm. and how far it goes back. I remember talking to some people in, uh, from Ar Alice Springs, Arenta, and, you know, what people expect from New South Wales that we mm. You know, we were the first impacted, but, mm. you know, then we sort of just mm. died out but stuck around. Mm. Um, <laughs> but even even from other people, as you were saying, mm. you know, those significant events, but mm. Aboriginal people from across Australia are now looking, and I've been told that people are looking at us as the shield people, mm. that we've kept, you know, a lot of contact and a lot of the impacts... Mm. and borne the brunt of that. So that's so important to actually mm. acknowledge that goes right back. Mm. And just for me, looking at, you know, yes, voice to parliament, mm. 
The unfortunate thing is we've always had a voice. We've just mm. heard how long that voice. Mm. It's whether people have listened to us mm. Mm. and understood us. Mm. And I think that's the big thing that we have the challenge, each and, indivi- each and every one of us, mm. that we don't in a hundred years mm. have another presentation <laughs> of all the work. You know, it is time to change. Mm. It's people like Professor Maynard, but also each and every one of us here coming here hearing this. And that's the great thing and the, the privilege that the Museums of History in New South Wales is holding these events like First Nation Speaker Series. So watch this space, mm. look at our website um, of more of these discussions to come and just like to finally once more thank Professor Maynard <laughs> for his time and generosity. Yeah. And thank you all for coming here tonight and being part of this. Thank you. See you soon. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks, Pete. That was great.